there, I'm Lloyd Evans and I am an ex-Jehovah's Witness and it's from that perspective that I like to invite other ex-Jehovah's Witnesses onto the channel so that I can learn more about their experience and I have a brand new ex-Jehovah's Witness or at least recently announced as an ex-Jehovah's Witness, Chris Duckman. Hey, what's up man? It's an absolute thrill to have you on. Um, I wondered whether this would ever happen. I've been having <laughs> lots of people in my ear saying, when are you going to interview Chris Duckman? So <laughs> it's an absolute thrill. Do you need an introduction? Uh, you're a filmmaker, you're a movie critic, you're an all-round nice chap, and oh, now thanks. you're an apostate. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a horrible thing. Uh, no, that's great. Um, thank you so much for that intro. Uh, I've been talking with you off and on uh, since before I made my video, you know, just kind of letting you know, like, hey, I'm thinking about going public about this and kind of asking some of your advice because you have a lot of experience talking about that online and sort of dealing with the way it all works. And so you were a, a great source of advice and encouragement before I made that video. And I just want to thank you for that. My pleasure. And it was nice to kind of experience a little bit of that before because I could sense how much apprehension there was on your part um what's it like on the other side now are you is it good to have that off your chest oh man um yes incredibly uh it's been overwhelming actually hearing from so many other ex Jehovah's witnesses or people from other faiths who felt trapped in their faiths or just people in general who related to the story you know i i've had i've heard so many different stories over the past few days of uh, people with medical issues that the JWs interfered with, um, many different abuse stories, and, and tons of people who are just shocked that that goes on behind closed doors, which I think is one of the biggest things that um, a lot of people don't really realize. The, uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are often viewed as those smiling people who come to the door and you kind of, you either talk to them or you don't. But there's just so much more that goes on and I'm really happy to see people noticing that and paying attention to it. Well that leads nicely into one of my questions because arguably one of the reasons why Jehovah's Witnesses are kind of the best kept secret or the cultiness of Jehovah's Witnesses is such a good secret is because there is so little exposure. I'm thinking exposure of the kind that Leah Remini brings to Scientology, it shouldn't be the case that it rests on the shoulders of celebrities to shine a light on this. But unfortunately, <laughs> that's the way it works. People take a notice, take notice of these things when there's a name or a person that they can associate. Uh, you have a raft of different celebrities, including some big Hollywood names. You have Luke, Luke Evans, Michelle Rodriguez, um, you have Donald Glover. Um, and obviously they will have their own reasons as to why they do or don't want to speak about their experience. But I think you coming out and talking about your experience as someone who is followed by nearly 2 million subscribers, big name in you know filmmaking, it really does lend some weight to this whole dialogue. I really am gra glad to hear that too, because um, that was one of the, the things that I noticed over the years was that um, whenever someone would be asked about that or, or if they discussed it, it would sort of be just like a little blurb, an excerpt you might see out of an interview, one sentence, and it's just kind of passed passed on. And and I'm assuming the reason for that is, is, is the fear of consequences, the fear of alienation or isolation from your family and just being treated like a sub-citizen. Um, I think that that's why so many people don't talk about it. Or, you know, it, it's also possible that some of those folks just were never really that involved with it and, and they kind of just accepted it as part of their family's life. But there's, there's you know, Prince uh, was a Jehovah's Witness for a while. He's he's passed on. Michael Jackson, you know. It, it, there, were, there were tons of people who at, at some point were involved with the faith, but they just never talked about it all that much or it's possible their experience was like not really that amazing like it just kind of came and went and nothing terrible happened to them and they just were like all right well that's over but 
if you're in the faith and you are really trying to be like an A plus Jehovah's Witness, um, it's going to be crazy for you because you're going to go through a lot of the things that, that I went through. And I know you went through because there's this pressure to conform to this ideal, this list of very specific things that you must do and you must follow. And if you don't, it's like the way I always describe it is it's like if your entire family are, are lawyers and doctors and you're like, you know, I think I might be a manager of a Taco Bell. You know, you're going to get paid and you're, you have a job, but your entire family is going to be disappointed in you. And it's kind of like that, you know, <laughs> that's one way of describing it. <laughs> Manager of the title <laughs> of Bell. Um, I just want to kind of set the scene for perhaps I'm aware that perhaps some viewers aren't aware of, of the nature of your coming out. It happened in an interesting way because you were interviewed on Double Toasted. I watched that interview. Mm -hmm. And I think around the 50 minute mark, you just unleash. <laughs> you just let the yeah. genie out of the bottle and, and share your story. And you've since gone on to release your own video. Super apostate. <laughs> you've taken it to another level with your own video where you go into this in more detail. Um, I would like to, if it's possible, just go back and get a bit more of your backstory. Um, but one question I have is, do you think you would have done all this if you were being treated better by your parents? Um, yes, yes, I would have done all of this. Um, I, for the past two years, two, yes, two years, um, I guess three years now, uh, I've been working on a, on a, like an autobiography about this experience, um, it was always going to happen. It was just a matter of when, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I always knew that I would, I would at some point talk about it. I found it a lot easier to write about. I'll be honest, like just writing about it was, it was, it was easier because you could really try to finely tune your thoughts and make sure you're writing it in the way you want to. And, and being on video doing it, I, I immediately felt more compromised, but I'm glad I did it. And I think that it, it did some good and, but yeah, no, I was always going to, to talk about it because the way my parents are, I can tolerate easily. My mother is very supportive of my film career. Um, she has expressed disappointment in me, but she, but, but she is far more supportive of that, um, it's just one of those things where every few weeks I'll get a voicemail that's like, Hey, brother and sister so-and-so uh, said that they miss you and they hope you're doing well and they'd love to see you again. And I say the same thing every time. I'm like, they can just call me, you know, if they really miss me, uh, I will talk to them and say hello and I won't try to sell them Christmas cookies. <laughs> If you really miss me, just say, just say hello. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. So yeah, it's, uh, I would have absolutely made this video eventually, um, or released the book. It, it would have happened at some point. I just decided this year that I was tired of keeping things hidden, that I was tired of pretending and I feel so much better now. And I just feel really good that so many people have, in some way, shape or form been positively affected by that video. And, and that was really the main goal was just to try to make people understand that when you leave that faith, you aren't as alone as it seems. You really aren't. It feels like your entire social network has been taken away and it has. Well, that's in many ways, the utility of, of having these interviews on my channel is to remind people that their experience really isn't unique and they're really not alone. This is a shared experience um, that is being experienced by people from many different backgrounds. Um, perhaps we can go back to your background um, and it would be nice if my viewers could learn how Jehovah's Witnesses came to be a part of your upbringing. Sure, yeah. Um, my parents, uh got a, someone on their doorstep in the seventies. My mother, uh, studied first, 
my father was very much not interested, um, from what I understand. My mom was, uh, she had told me that their viewpoint of God made sense to her and that certain things seemed to click. And so she started studying first, then, uh, then her mother started studying and eventually my father saw something in it and, and they all got baptized. Um, then they had my oldest sister in the early seventies. And, uh, in the later seventies, they had my other sister and in the late eighties, they had me, I was a surprise. They weren't expecting to have me. Um, but You're full of everyone surprises, was Chris. Uh, super hardcore JW at that point. <laughs> uh, everyone was a super hardcore JW at that point. And, uh, so people were going for it. You know, it was, it was the way life was. So when I was raised, there was no other life. There was no alternative. There was no outside of that. That was the only thing I knew. And now on the other side of it, I can see how easy it is to, to mold a young mind into what you want it to be, you know, because I genuinely was like, well, this is just the world. This is it. This is the way the world is. This is the way it works. Here's the rules. There's the consequences. That's it. So as a kid, um, the meetings were fun because I was little and I could have a little notebook and I could draw little pictures or whatever for, you know, 90 minutes. And I could pal around with my other buddies and, you know, run around and do stuff. But eventually it became clear that something was expected of me as I got older, um, into my teens. And, you know, that's normal in life. You get older, you take on more responsibilities and there are consequences with some of those responsibilities. But when it comes to this faith, you get older, especially if you're a, a man, and your father is an elder, which my dad was, you, it's sort of like, aren't you going to try that too? Aren't you at least going to try to pioneer or be a ministerial servant or become an elder one day? And, you know, my parents with schooling were always very like, as long as you do your best, okay, that's good. And I usually got above C's, B's, A's. I rarely ever got anything below a C plus until, um, uh, later middle school when I started experiencing religious doubt. My schooling went down. My drive to do anything went down. But at that point before beforehand, I was on board, man. I was ready. I was just like, this is it. I am going to be the JW Superman and I am going to convert so many people and have so many Bible studies and all my young friends are going to get baptized and I'm going to get baptized and we're going to live forever and it's going to be the best thing ever. Um, now looking back though, I didn't really come to terms with how distant I actually was mentally because I can recall so many times sitting at the circuit assembly or the district convention or the kingdom hall and just looking up and imagining like Spider-Man swinging around or, uh, you know, some crazy thing. Cause I was just so not there, you know, they're not really experiences that are conducive to you know captivating a child's attention are they sitting in a windowless <laughs> building or sitting in a sports arena <laughs> and listening to old guys <laughs> drone on about things that are nonsensical um so i can totally relate yeah. to that so i was bored out of my mind for a lot of those experiences but uh i kept convincing myself that i was supposed to be there i kept convincing myself this is what i'm supposed to do because there really was no alternative I did not, I didn't know what an alternative was. The uh, perspective of anything outside of that faith is so damning from the JW viewpoint that just little tiny things like if I slipped a, a curse word at school, or I remember uh, my mom had an ad for, for like uh, clothing, a clothing store. And, and there was a lingerie model on it. And I remember just glancing at the lingerie model and then feeling like I had to say a prayer and like ask for forgiveness because of just a, a, a quick glance, you know, like it was just, 
it was it, it was insane, man. It was crazy. And so, as a as a teenager, uh, I eventually got baptized at age sixteen. Um, an elder moved to our congregation when I was about fifteen, who uh, encouraged me considerably to do that and to pioneer. He was a pioneer, so I wanted to go out and service more. I wanted to do all that. Um, I was conducting Bible studies with people. Uh, when I got baptized at 16, most of my younger friends in the congregation were not yet baptized. Uh, and so I was sort of viewed all of a sudden as like the number one JW youth at my congregation. Like I'm supposed to help all of them. I, I need to set a good example for them. I need to encourage them so they can get baptized or so that they can, you know, reach their spiritual enlightenment and so the elders sort of started to take me under their wing and use me in a way as a guide for those other young people and and give me advice like hey we heard that uh you know young brother so and so was uh seen at a uh, high school dance party and uh we you know you might want to just encourage him to to not do those types of things if you get the opportunity. It'd be stuff like that, you know? Young brother so-and-so, his meeting attendance is down. Um, maybe you could, instead of inviting him to a movie, you could invite him out in the field ministry. That kind of stuff. So, and you know this, you know, this is not news to you. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, everything, as long as it's, as long as it's to do with the religion, it's fine. Anything outside, mm, do you really need to do that? I can remember being really interested or starting to get really interested in soccer and my team, Manchester United, and I would buy the magazine of my club, Manchester United, every month. It came out monthly. And I remember very vividly my mother saying to me, oh, your dad came home from work the other day and saw you reading the Manchester United magazine. And he said to me, I'd really like to come home from work and see Lloyd reading The Watchtower instead. There's just, <laughs> you're uh, not allowed to have anything outside of this super spiritual sphere of existence, you know? So I relate to what you're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other things were recreation. You know, that word was, was thrown around a lot. Recreation. What is your, the, what is the amount of recreation that you are partaking in? And, you know, that included anything really that wasn't basic family responsibilities and spiritual stuff. So really anything. If you played a game of basketball, if you read a magazine that wasn't The Watchtower, if you read a book that wasn't from the society, if you watched a show that wasn't from the society, if you did anything besides those two basic things, family stuff and spiritual stuff, it was considered recreation. And so when asked how much recreation are you engaged in, I would begin to feel like I was some lazy idiot that didn't work hard enough because I'd be like, well, I, I don't know. I like to watch films. I like to write and I like to play basketball and I like to you know, ride my bike and shit. Like, am, am I gonna die? <laughs> like I just, It'd be this crazy stuff, man, that, that just didn't really coalesce eventually. The, the, these things kept happening to the point where I, I began to experience doubt and, and not in the way that I think, from what I understand, a lot of folks do is sometimes they read a doctrine that doesn't make sense or a rule is changed for the 17th time and suddenly they start to have doubt. For younger people though, Sometimes it's, and I can't speak for everyone, of course, but sometimes it is genuinely because you feel so restricted. You feel like there's really no way to express yourself in any form except going in the field ministry and talking to strangers about the Bible. How do you express yourself artistically? How do you express your true feelings uh, about your, your own identity? And, and, and those things are, are squashed as well. And so it, it quickly, after getting baptized, it, it became really clear to me that all of a sudden I was being groomed to eventually be an elder. Um, I didn't realize that until after I was baptized, but I wanted to be an elder. I just didn't realize that 
they were going to take so many drastic measures in my life to affect those close to me, friends and family, just because of this goal. And I sort of became like a, a, like a guinea pig in a way for certain tests that these elders would, would give me. They would assign me things in the congregation that weren't normal. Like for instance, um, the, the best way I can describe this is a special pioneer elder from Brooklyn Bethel was assigned to come to our congregation. And when they made an announcement that he would arrive, they used the words correction and take a new direction. And it became very clear that this man was being sent to our congregation to kind of whip us into shape because we had issues spiritually. Which isn't really the way it should be done. It shouldn't be that they assign a special pioneer to do that. That's what the circuit overs is supposed to do. Not right. just some random special pioneer, no matter where he's assigned from. It's odd that right. they would do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and since leaving, I have searched his name in uh, various JW forums, and I have found that many people have had issues with this person. Um, and so it's not just me. But anyway, he comes to the hall. And first off, I'm tall, but he's maybe taller than me and incredibly imposing of a, in a physical stature. Like he's just extremely tall and basically everyone... Darth Vader. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, he came through the hall. He, he went like this and looked around at all of our dead bodies and, just, <laughs> and walked. <laughs> um, yeah. So he comes in the hall. And he, it becomes very clear that whenever he enters a room, people get nervous. People get like um, a higher ranked person has, has entered the, the room and suddenly people are standing up straight and, and trying not to get in trouble. And when he arrived at our hall, he was a virtual wrecking ball to the young people in our congregation. There were like eight of us within... I think four years of his arrival, that went down to three. Now, he might view that as a good thing. Like, oh, I'm just sift, uh, you know, sifting the wheat from the chaff. But this, hmm. to me, was a bunch of young people who were being traumatized by this man. And I was used as a pawn to try to position them in ways that he could get his talons in him, so to speak. For instance, Childhood friend of mine, uh, who I'm still friends with, by the way, and he has left, thank God. Uh, he was a year younger than me, and we were very close. But I was closer to his brother. His brother is the person who I mentioned in my video, called me, left a voicemail on my phone, and said, we can't hang out anymore because you've been marked. His younger brother I was still friends with. And they lived together, obviously, because we were still teenagers at the time. Um, no, I was, when I left, I was early 20s. But when this happened, when I'm, the story I'm telling, we were teenagers. Um, this elder, this special pioneer comes to me and says, uh, I don't think you should associate with this, uh, this younger man anymore. And I'm like, and we'll call him Dave. His name's not Dave. I did another podcast yesterday night and I talked about him as well. And we, we called him Dave. Um, so he's like, I don't think you should associate with Dave anymore. And I'm like, why Dave? What is, what did Dave do now? He, Dave is not baptized. Dave is been raised in this faith and he has liked it, gone out in service, gone to the majority of meetings and studied with my dad and me for many years. So, as far as I'm concerned, he's like a great kid. In fact, I think any parent who had a kid like that would be extremely happy. You know, no smoking, no cursing, nothing. He's just a good all around person, but his meeting attendance, Lloyd. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> his, his meeting attendance is not good. <laughs> so, this elder comes to me and says, I don't think you should be associating with Dave anymore. 
uh, because you, by association, are giving him the blessings of being a true servant of Jehovah, even though he isn't. So I look at this elder, and, and this is really the first kind of like, I'm an older teenager at this point, and I'm starting to really contextualize my youth and kind of filter it through almost adult eyes. And I'm like, this, this isn't right. This elder took me aside, brought me in a back room, closed the door, no lights on, says no prayer, reads no scriptures, tells me to not talk to Dave anymore because of his meeting attendance. And I leave that room and I remember walking through the hall because the meeting had just ended and everyone's voices are echoing and people are laughing and talking and hugging. And that was the very first time that that ever sounded uh, alien to me. I remember it just sounding robotic, almost electronic, and just suddenly not feeling welcome anymore because I did not understand that direction at all. Here's somebody who's a good person who I've known forever, who is spiritually trying. He's just not making all the meetings. And suddenly I'm literally not to speak to him, even though he's not baptized. He has not committed any offense of any kind. I learned that this elder had gone to every single young person in the congregation and told them the same thing. So Dave is now alone. No one speaks to him. Now, one of the most difficult things about this is, as I said, his brother was my best friend. I see his brother two, three times a week, recreationally, plus the kingdom hall. So I go over to his house and him and I have to lock ourselves in his fucking room because Dave is over there and we can't talk to Dave. That kind of stuff, man. And he's not even baptized. You know, this is just, hey, I wonder if Chris and the young people in this congregation will take this direction that isn't actually scriptural that we're not going to say a prayer for or read any scriptures and just kind of see what happens. It felt like they were testing all of us. Interestingly, even though I was baptized at this point and my best friend was newly baptized, he came to me and said, I don't think this is right. I think what they're doing to Dave is wrong. And I think that uh, we need to talk to him again. So for the first time in my life, I defied the elders first time not listening to them. And I just started talking to my friend again. I cannot tell you how happy Dave was. He was just relieved to no extent. He was so depressed. He thought everyone had abandoned him and, and that, which is, exa is exactly what happened. So, and I was also surprised to, to see absolutely no repercussions to me or any of the other young people who started associating with Dave again, which proved to me that they had no scriptural basis for telling us to do that. And they did not know how to uh, reprimand us for that. So for all I know, though, his experiment, this elder worked because I genuinely believe he came in there with a psychological goal. Let's take one of them. that's not baptized that we don't really have our claws in yet and just see if people will avoid him and that's what it felt like and um so many young people left after that and that was just that was just the start of the iceberg i have so many other stories with that elder well that's a good one um and this shows i think the layers of shunning because you know when we talk about shunning people assume we're just talking about disfellowshipping but what your story shows, not just the story that you've just told, but other stories that you tell, is that there are varieties of shunning <laughs> that are deployed within this religion. There's bad association, which is what you just described. There's marking, which you also have some experience with. And then there's full on disfellowshipping and disassociation. All are forms of ostracism intended to control people. And they're all um, widely used in this religion. It sounds though as though you've had a run-in there with what I like to call a bully elder. And I've been an elder yeah. for a year 
and one of the elders on the body was a bully elder. Um, he was prolific at making people in the congregation miserable to the point where much of my work as an elder involved trying to cheer people up and trying to undo the damage he was doing in the congregation. I can remember I had um, a younger friend of mine who I'd actually uh, had a Bible study with. His, his family were Jehovah's Witnesses and it fell to me to study with him and get him baptised. And he had kind of like a thing with a sister in a neighbouring congregation um, and this bully elder decided that the relationship needed to end. And so he basically ordered this kid to stop the relationship. And he said, if you don't do that, you'll not, you'll not be allowed to have any privileges in the congregation. And I kid you not, this lad ended up breaking out into acne and everything. He had a really uh, physical reaction to being put under that kind of pressure. It sounds as though you had a similar character come into your congregation. And like you say, he ended up doing more harm than good from the organization's point of view, because probably some of these young kids who you hung out with would still be witnesses today, if not for the involvement of this character. Yeah, and uh, and that's a great way of putting it, because I think for some of these uh, people who are in positions of power in the faith, they find a sort of cyclical way of justifying their counsel. And for this elder, he comes in, like I said, smashes young people, destroys relationships, comes up with ideas about how people in this congregation are acting, makes judgmental decisions about them, characters, uh, their, their character, I should say. Then he manipulates them to such an extent that they are traumatized, as the, the young person you just mentioned. And when they later leave, that elder says, see, I knew that something was wrong with them. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's genuinely like an abusive uh, partner in a relationship who Indeed. abuses abuses the person to such an extent that that individual breaks and either retaliates or just is is a broken person to the point where that abuser can go see you know I knew you were this weak the whole time and it's like no man you've been beating all of these people into the ground and now they're they're weak as a result one of the things that the Jehovah's Witnesses that I experienced, and it seems like the majority uh, of those in power, especially elders and governing body, don't realize is cause and effect. It's a very simple, simple thing, cause and effect. If the effect is a 16-year-old who gets baptized, wants to be an elder, pioneers, wants to help his friends, later leaves the faith, and then 10 years after that becomes a full-blown apostate. If that's the effect, what was the cause? Do you think I just magically one day woke up and decided I want to not like this faith? I want to not be a part of it? Of course not. What caused that? It wasn't me watching movies. It wasn't me listening to music they didn't like. It was the way they treated myself and my friends and my family even. So, but cause and effect is lost on Jehovah's Witnesses. They just look at the present. Oh, this person is so lost. He really needs help. He's left the organization. She's done this thing. She's doing this thing. They're doing drugs, whatever it is. And they don't see the cause. And the cause is so often them. <laughs> you speak about young people being broken. Um, one of the most compelling and probably heartbreaking parts of your video where you explain your background is the part where you show the closing of your first YouTube channel. I was watching that and wow, it <laughs> hits you like a punch because you're seeing someone who's literally being broken, who is being forced to do something that they clearly, clearly don't want to do. 
Um, and it, it's so, so bizarre as well that this should be the thing. This is the hill your elders needed to die on was yeah. you being interested in movies and reviewing movies. So, so talk us through that. Um, was it the same elder who was involved in trying to stop you from doing movie reviews? Yeah, there, there were three. Uh, right. I, I'm thinking that, um, the one from, from Brooklyn Bethel was probably sort of like the ringleader, but there were three that were absolutely, uh, heavily involved with it. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how it went down because, uh, like I said in the video, I gave you the, the Cliff Notes version. Because um, I, I could have sat there for 10 hours, you know, and just... I could have brought in guests, like people I know <laughs> who have been victimized. And I call just like my they, first witness. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not even joking, even. Um, in fact, even right now, I got to be honest with you, there's, there's, there's nuclear bomb level stories I have... And the only reason I have not shared them is because I am waiting for permission from those involved who are victims. Right. That's it. That's it, man. That's it. There's, there's so there's much more, more coming. Oh, you don't even know. You don't even know, man. Find out I mean, actually, week, you know what? Same bat you time, do. same bat channel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But honestly, yeah. yeah, you do. You do know, actually, I shouldn't yeah. say that you, you know, um, yeah. so Basically, uh, I started doing my reviews and they were very innocent. Um, the movies I would review were all PG-13 or below and things like Star Trek, um, 500 Days of Summer, Transformers, you know, stuff that I knew Jehovah's Witnesses watched. Um, no language, um, no anything <laughs> for all accounts and purposes they were g-rated reviews the first movie i ever reviewed was ponyo the hayao miyazaki animation so but they weren't getting much attention they were getting like 16 views 20 views 100 views you know it was just sort of like whatever around the time that my videos started to get a little more attention and so like when they started to get more than a thousand views I remember the first time uh, someone in the hall mentioned that they had seen one of my reviews. And I remember being like, actually excited by that. You know, I didn't, I was so naive and oblivious to, to what was going on, but people were starting to, to watch my channel in the congregation and, and pay attention to what I was doing and saying. And uh, it became clear that it wasn't because they liked my content. It was because they were checking in on me, you know, they were making sure that I wasn't saying or doing anything inappropriate. Eventually, uh, the elders met with me about it. And in the first elders meeting that I had with the three of them, they didn't outright tell me to quit the channel. They didn't say anything about, they didn't say anything too scary about it but they they mentioned did they really about... lock the door yeah oh yeah <laughs> that's such a weird oh, yeah. thing to do <laughs> oh no 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 we don't I, want I him remember... escaping while we're talking <laughs> about movie reviews <laughs> make no, sure he man. doesn't breach the perimeter <laughs> yeah exactly uh, close the blast doors um <laughs> yeah no they they would lock the door because i remember it was a really heavy click very heavy click of that lock um so you know the first meeting is sort of congenial so there's some kindness there's some understanding just a few basic scriptures about loving violence and about recreation and about priorities things like that and um I said, thank you. I'll consider all of that. You know, I, I was just saying in my head, I was thinking, oh, well, they're just saying don't get too involved with it, which is one of the one of the biggest reasons I did the quick movie reviews thing first, because I was like, well, these will be short videos. They won't take a lot, a lot of time to make. Um, it'll be easy and it won't take a lot of time out of my spiritual life because I had a regular job at that time, five days a week. And of course, the meetings and field service. And so I was honestly, I, I didn't have much time anyway to do those types of things. So 
you know, I left and I just kept doing what I was doing. Soon enough, though, it became clear that uh, there was a, a there was an issue. So I got called back in. And uh, this is before the the, 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 <laughs> the, guy, the clock. Uh, this is this is before the, uh, the the Thor experience that was on my uh, my second channel. But um, right. the first channel, though, uh, I have a feeling it was right around the time that I started to do kind of well. And videos started to explode a little bit. And when I say explode, I'm talking like, you know, a thousand views. Um, things were, people were watching. And I got called in again and it was, now it wasn't just reading the scriptures. They mentioned the channel. They mentioned what I was doing specifically, calling out certain videos, certain reviews, certain movies, um, making the entire meeting about the YouTube channel. So it seemed to me like, okay, they got together and went, he didn't get it the first time. We need to be clearer. Um, now is when they started to really start to talk about how much time was I spending on YouTube? Was I taking other Jehovah's Witness youth with me to the movies that I was seeing? And I'd be like, yes, I'm going with this person and this person and this person and we're seeing movies. And they would say things like, well, are their parents aware of that? <laughs> and I feel like, yes, you, you, you guys were it. sneaking out of your bedroom windows at like yes. nine or ten in the in the evening, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to go watch, you know, Star Trek. Um, <laughs> now, the here was a big issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> here was the biggest. The big issue, though, was that, and this is very, very funny to me now looking back, is. Uh, when I first started the channel, I wanted to get my reviews up as early as I could. One of the easiest ways to do that was to find a theater that was showing a Thursday midnight showing of a movie because then I could run home, review the movie, edit it, and post it, and then go straight to work at 6 in the morning. But I'd have one of the first YouTube reviews of this movie. So, regularly, after the Thursday night meeting, I would meet up with young people in the congregation and we'd go to a Thursday midnight movie. Which would it undo all of the spiritual food that you've been taking in at the meeting that you just attended. Yes. Why did yes. you not see that? How would you, I, I mean, come on, I've got to side with the elders here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you're, you're right. That's exactly it is, as they would say that the problem wasn't the movies. It was the time of day. It was the fact that I did anything socially after midnight, which is fucking crazy but nevertheless <laughs> that became the uh the major topic of that meeting was that i was keeping jehovah's witness youth out of their homes after midnight even though their parents were fine with it and i must again reiterate we were over 18 you know you were adults <laughs> <laughs> yes yes going to the movies at, at midnight so that really was another issue was that it wasn't just that I was reviewing movies is that I was including other youth in my, uh, <laughs> my, my, my idiot, my idiotic, uh, desire to, to see films. So at that point, they, they basically suggested that, uh, they didn't appreciate what I was doing and that it was harming people in the congregation and that it was stumbling people in the congregation that I had become what's known as a stumbling block uh to people i'm to, stumbled uh, just thinking about it so i can understand good. that yeah <laughs> good uh, i'm glad that i've stumbled you um <laughs> but uh so yeah they they basically uh you know in so many words used every way that they could to say they wish i didn't do my channel anymore and that it was potentially uh going to drive me away from the young people in the congregation as well as my family they would talk about consequences of defying them. But like I said in the video, they could not say in a sentence, do not review movies on YouTube because they know that there is no scriptural backing for that uh, rule. Nevertheless, though, I was smart, you know, in a Jehovah's Witness sense, and I knew what they were saying. I knew that if I didn't do this, that I would never be an elder and never be a ministerial servant and that I would probably lose my congregation privileges because it would be, I'd be viewed as someone who is defying them. And it's the, the marking potentiality I was aware of as well. So I closed down the channel. And in that video, I 
as you saw, I had no idea how to explain it. There was no way to explain it. It didn't um, make any sense whatsoever. No, no <laughs> it made no sense. And, and, and honestly, it, and, and part of me, and this is the sad part, one of the biggest reasons I couldn't explain it was that at the time, I knew it would make Jehovah's Witnesses look bad. So I didn't. Because I was like, there's if, even if I explain this, it'll just make Jehovah's Witnesses look bad. I'll give a bad witness and Jehovah will be disappointed in me. And so I just made this vague, you know, something is wrong and I can't do it anymore video. Um, stepped away for many months after that. Just astonishing. And because you, you hear stories like this every now and then and you think, well, those, those are exceptions to the rule. But th these are just kind of extreme fanatical elders who are going too far. This doesn't represent this. These stories are not representative of the organization overall. But the problem you have is that when you give dudes power, they're going to use it. And it's not always going to be by the book. They're going to impose their opinions if they feel important because they've been given importance in the lives of a community. So this sort of thing is inevitable. I've experienced it. You've experienced it. Many people watching this have experienced it. Sure, it's not sanctioned in the literature to not make movie reviews, but these sort of insane prohibitions are inevitable when you give essentially janitors <laughs> and salesmen <laughs> power to interfere in people's lives. It, the problem was compounded by the fact that I was so oblivious to the fact that I could be reprimanded for talking about movies or making movies that I went around to the people in the congregation and said, hey, my friends and I are making an Indiana Jones fan film. Hey, we made this little short film. Would you like to see it? And I would take it to their houses, show it to them. And I, re I remember some people being like, that was cool, man. Good job. But then looking back now, I can sort of recognize what was going on with some other people who were watching it. Some of them elders. The first Indiana Jones movie I made, uh, even despite how amateur it was, you could tell that we were... Who trying... played Indiana Jones? <laughs> <laughs> Good casting choice, um, that. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hey, man, it, you got to work with the best you have, and that was you me. Did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, I, looking back now, though, I can see that their reaction, the elders who were watching it, it was that when they said, good job, that there was absolutely, they were hiding something. Because um, despite how amateur it was, some of the punches did look like they connected. We did an okay job of, of setting up the angle to make the punches and the kicking look real enough, you know, real enough to the point where they were like, ooh, this isn't like a bunch of amateur children anymore. Like they're starting to not, they're starting to understand how to make this stuff. Like they could tell that we were starting to figure it out, like th that we were learning how to make movies. Even if they were amateur, there were things we were doing that clearly were better than the things we were doing when we were younger. Because we, I started making movies when I was 14. At this point, I was older teens, and we had figured some shit out, and they were starting to notice. So on the first Indiana Jones movie, I remember being out in service with an elder, and I was just talking to him about it, like, yeah, we're making this Indiana Jones movie. It's going to be cool. It's going to be great. And this elder said, um, uh, who's playing Indiana Jones, just like you. And, and I said, me, and he said, um, do you have a costume? And I was like, yeah, but I need a jacket still. And he's like, you know, I have an old leather brown jacket you can use. He actually offered me his jacket. And I said, great. And we used his jacket. Uh, there's a scene in the movie where I am hanging off of the front of an SUV uh, a fellow Jehovah's Witness provided the SUV and drove it. We were filming in the backyard of a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, these, there's a scene with scorpions in the movie where a scorpion's crawling on my shoulder. Fellow Jehovah's Witness had the scorpions, provided the scorpions. 
every actor in the movie was a Jehovah's Witness. It was a Jehovah's Witness production. <laughs> um, what I am getting at is that I felt very supported by Jehovah's Witnesses while making this movie. I mean, an elder donated to the costume. So when I showed it to them, I think they were expecting some kids sort of like shadow boxing in their backyard. Like, I don't think they understood that the final product would be like a series of shots that told a story. Even again, I'm not complimenting my amateur teenage movie. I'm just saying that clearly we had some talent and clearly we understood how to assemble something even as cheap as it was. I think that shocked them and they felt like, oh no, like not only have we encouraged this, but clearly this isn't just a bunch of kids fooling around in their backyard. So with the second Indiana Jones fan film I made, all bets were off. There was no more like, we're helping you, no more donations to the production. And as soon as it was done and I showed people, I was in the elders meeting like that. I mean, about violence, about spiritism, because there was a mask in the movie that showed you your future. And to them, that was like spiritistic. And it was all this stuff. And it was just a nightmare. It became a nightmare after that. Everything I made was it was instantly scrutinized. And I realized that I couldn't actually share any of our short films with anyone except basically my parents and my close friends who made it. Because if I went beyond those boundaries, uh, somebody somewhere, if like if I put it on YouTube, somebody in a congregation would search it, find it, and call the elders, which happened many times. And it's all so innocent, you know? I, completely innocent in every way. I mean, we're talking about not even saying the word damn. <laughs> I mean, It's the sort of thing you'd be delighted if your kids were doing this sort of exact, thing. Exactly, exactly. And expressing exactly. their creativity. Yeah. And that is something my mother said. My mother has said that she she loved that I was doing it. And she, she's always very excited about my stories. She is still, still to this day, even though she's probably wishes I was stronger in the faith or whatever, but she's, she's, she is supportive of, of my filmmaking endeavors without a doubt. She has been supportive. She bought me my camera when I was a kid and I, I don't want to make it, her out to be a villain at all. She's not. But when it came to, um, her, she would say things in support of me to the elders at times. She would say like, look, my son's not out doing heroin. Like he's just making movies with his friends. You know, it's, she, she did go to bat for me uh, a few times and try to really help out. Um, but as you know, the congregation does not take women seriously. The congregation is, is absolutely horrible, uh, to women. And, um, like for, for her to have any push or leeway with them, uh, it just doesn't exist because she's, uh, she's not the head of the household, you know, that fucking term. So my mom did try to help a lot, but there was really nothing that could be done once they decided that, uh, uh, I was not doing good things. And how did this link in with the Thor meeting? Was this before <laughs> or after the Thor uh, meeting? Yeah. So that was after I restarted my channel. Right. Uh, there was a six month period where I didn't do it. And as I talked about in my video, I've never been in a darker spot. Uh, I barely did anything. Uh, except go to the meetings. I just went to the meetings, went out in service with my dad. We did early morning service at like 6 a.m. on Saturdays. Oh, at yeah. people's homes? No, no. Uh, ah. In uh, I'm from Akron, Ohio, and uh, in Akron, it's a, it's a semi-large city, uh, but we would basically preach to people who are on the street walking around. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I've done that kind of thing. So, yeah. 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 So like, you know, you might see a homeless person, you might see just someone walking and this is, this is so strange. I've never really talked about this, but now I realize I am a over six foot guy wearing a long black coat, approaching people on the street at 6 AM. <laughs> Preparing to offer them something. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello, sir. Would you like to, <laughs> You know, 
um, so, but anyway, I did that and, and those, those six months were the worst, the, just the mm-hmm. absolute worst. Um, everyone could tell something was wrong. My parents could tell something was wrong. Um, but I didn't know how to express what was wrong because people would ask me if I was okay. And I would just have to say yes, because if I said no, I feel like I'm in uh, the wrong faith. I feel like I'm, I'm having serious doubts. Then there, the problems would just be compounded because if I admit that to somebody, well, then now I'm going to have a lot more problems. So, uh, at the time, and, and I'm just going to tell, tell you this, uh, and I've never really talked about this. And at the time, um, I had become close with, uh, uh, a friend of mine who, I met through Facebook. Uh, it was a worldly girl. Oh, oh boy. She really liked my channel. She liked my videos and we just chatted very innocently, but it became clear pretty soon that there was a little more than just friendship. And, uh, it was nice. It was my first like actual girlfriend, um, and wasn't a witness. And so I obviously felt pretty, pretty bad. Like I was doing some really bad stuff. Did you try preaching to her? Um, Kind of, yeah. Oh. Um, for the first Been few there, weeks, done yes. That. <laughs> yeah. For yeah. the first few weeks, I kind of expressed to her that I wasn't going to be cursing. Um, and so she started to censor herself around me, which, you know, that was nice of her, I guess. That was cool. I'm still really good friends with this person, by the way. And mm-hmm. she's, a, she's a great person. She's a great person. She helped me a lot when I was uh, having doubts and leaving Um, so we decided we'd meet, it was a long distance relationship and I suddenly had to figure out how to explain to my parents who I still live with. Now I I must reiterate here, man, I am like my early twenties, uh, my first real girlfriend and I have to somehow sneak out of the fucking house. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, so I, uh, I tell my parents that I am feeling a lot of pressure and depression and weight from life and that I need to take a personal vacation, my first ever alone vacation. And actually all of that is completely true. Um, I say, I'm going to go visit some friends that I met online. Also true. I just left out the world word girl in front of friend. <laughs> And you um, left that worldly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, I think they knew though that they were worldly. I think mm-hmm. they knew that though. Um, so I went on this trip, and um, it was great. It was fantastic, and it was one of the first times that I truly saw a life outside of that organization, and I felt genuinely free uh, for about a week. It was one of, it was up until then, that was the best week in my life I had ever had. And, um, going back home was very difficult, but I did it. Um, suddenly people started to ask me a lot of questions about what I had done on my trip. You know, where were you? Where'd you go? Who'd you see? Um, I had this whole scheme. I had taken photos of a hotel. <laughs> uh, that I was like, here's the hotel I stayed at. Um, but I was, I was definitely staying with pictures of you in the kingdom hall. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yes. Here I am standing next to brother person. Um, yes. Uh, but I had stayed at her, my girlfriend's family's house while I was there. So, but I didn't know how to explain to my parents that in my early twenties, I had my first girlfriend because that would be an issue, I guess. Um, and this is even with me trying to do all the spiritual things right with this person, you know, and she was accommodating enough to actually deal with that because she knew I was decompressing from this place. Like she was I think we cool know, enough. I think we all know what that means. Yeah. So yeah, you were, like she, you were sticking to the rules. Yeah. I did my best, man. I really mm-hmm. did. I did my best. And, and, and looking back now, I wish that I had just not, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
I did my best. I did my best. Yeah. Uh, I, I won't lie, though, like there were things that we engaged in that could have been a problem for the elders, but I absolutely did my best to mm -hmm. just, you know, not do anything wrong. I remember even even trying that hard, I still was crying at night while I was there because I felt like I, I was sinning and I was praying and I was begging for forgiveness and all of this stuff when I should have been incredibly happy and just allowed mm -hmm. to be a regular person. So, uh, when I came back, certain, uh, Jehovah's witness youth who had become uh, stronger in the faith than me began to pay attention to my Facebook posts. And they began to notice that a certain girl was liking just about everything I wrote. Any photo I posted, Rookie she would mistake. like the photo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any photo I posted, she'd like the photo. She uh, interacted with me all the time on, in, in public on Facebook, but it was always innocent. Cause I told her, I was like, we can't like send hearts to each other or anything in public. Like it has to be like very innocent stuff. You have um, to send hearts to each other in private messages. Yes. <laughs> That's when you send hearts. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, so here's, here's th again, this is funny looking back this next story, but in red, it, it it was traumatizing in the moment, but it looking back, it, it was funny. I, uh, a Jehovah's witness friend invites me to his house and I go up to his room and he has a circle of fold out chairs in his room. And in them are other Jehovah's witness youth. And essentially what I'm walking into is an intervention. <laughs> okay. So my young friend, my young friend, who's two years younger than me, uh, has decided that because of all of these interactions he's seen on Facebook, I must be committing fornication and shooting up heroin and everything that could ever be bad, you know, that would have been my conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> So he sits me down and, and he has made his little like miniature elders meeting in his room. Um, and he starts asking me about who this girl is. What did you do on your vacation? And I, I, I mean, I lie to him. I tell him, I, I don't know what you're talking about. She's just a, a, a nice person. You know, I'm not ready to tell these people these things. I'm not ready to lose my friends and family because I have a girlfriend obviously. So I, I tell him that, uh, it's just a friend and, and, uh, we move on, but that's the kind of way that even some of the more indoctrinated youth will treat you when they suspect that you are doing something wrong. Like they feel like they have to save you. Like it's their responsibility to save you from whatever it is. So I started my channel again after my girlfriend at the time asked me, she said, um, like I said in my video, I said, uh, she said, um, did you enjoy reviewing movies on YouTube? And I said, yes. And she said, then why aren't you? And I said, I, I don't know. And I, I realized basically that, that they were destroying my life in every way, that they were taking away everything I cared about and trying to manipulate me and, and mold me into a robot. And I said, screw it. And I just started my channel again. And I'm very glad that I did. Very glad that I did. You mentioned, um, being in a dark place up to that point where your girlfriend helped you and you know mental health is is kind of there as a theme when you're talking about your story to the point where i notice you've put links below for people who um are feeling suicidal because this is a very real risk you know due to the restrictions that are placed on people um to what extent was mental health an issue among your friends? I think that, especially for my friend Dave, who had been forcibly isolated for doing nothing except not attending meetings re as regularly as he could. And when I say irregular, I mean like he might go once a week instead of two, three times a week, you know? So for him, definitely, he, he shut himself away quite often after that felt 
very betrayed, even though we were all talking to him again and, and we were great again as friends and he understood why we did what we did. He felt very betrayed by the people in the congregation and whatever faith he had at that point was completely squashed. It was diminished because he was like, well, even if I don't do anything wrong, they're still going to do this to me. At what point can I be what they want me to be? And he, and he, I think knew in that moment that this, this isn't going to work out. Um, a couple of my friends were starting to get really strong in the faith though. My best friend was baptized and he was like, all of a sudden, super Jehovah's Witness, like hardcore, like me when I got baptized. Um, and then my younger friend who had his little intervention, obviously was, was super strong in the faith. If you ask me, how was their mental health? I would say extremely poor, but that's just my perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, when it came to me though, and, and I, and I mean this with all seriousness, I was beginning to imagine how did I want my parents to find my body? I had all those thoughts and I, I thought about, did I want to be there? Did I want to be there? How did I want to look? Did I want to write a note? You know, all that stuff. And, uh, Thankfully, it is mostly because of my girlfriend at the time that I was able to keep a shred of sanity because just everything was tumbling down on me at that point. Anyone that I knew that was a Jehovah's Witness was starting to turn on me. And I was trying to justify why they would do that in my head. I was trying to figure out because like I said, my parents knew I did movie reviews. My parents knew I made movies. They had watched all of the shorts that we had made since we were kids. The elders helped a little bit with one of my movies by donating to the production. And I was trying to understand why that all seemed like a nice incline and why suddenly it was just going like this. It couldn't just be because I was reviewing movies. It couldn't just be that stuff. It really couldn't. That's just a combination of things that made me feel like it was impossible to please the Jehovah's Witnesses at my congregation. It was just impossible. There was no way that I could be myself while also trying to be a good Jehovah's Witness because I still was trying. I was still making all the fucking meetings and everything. I was still going out in service once a week because if I didn't, my father would be disappointed, you know? And, and so even with all of that, I remember just sitting there in my room thinking, this still isn't enough. At what point will this be enough? You know? Do you think your girlfriend might have saved your life? Uh, it's possible. Yeah, it's, it's possible. And I've told mm -hmm. her so much. Uh, I've told her so since, you know, that's, that's one of the, we're still friends because like once we decided that we were sort of going separate ways, uh, career wise and certain things just weren't going to mesh. Mm -hmm we were like, we want to be friends still though. So let's mm. just like, it's the cliche. Like, can we still be friends? But we actually still were friends. Like we still mm. talk like every week. So that's great. And yeah, no, I think that she, um, she definitely assisted a, a lot in that regard. Um, and the other thing that helped was, uh, film. I, I would just lose myself in writing and, making movies, uh, even though I couldn't make any with my friends at that point, cause nobody wanted to help me. I had found other Jehovah's witness youth who were sort of on the fence and starting to fall away who kind of wanted to help sometimes. And we'd make a movie or something together. Um, so it was movies, her, and just a, a passion for, for that career that definitely kept me out of that. But I, I was, uh, and, and thank you for sharing that, by the way, I, I just think that mental health is such a, a crucial ingredient in our experience on this planet and in being able to make it through life and to have your dreams crushed in that way. Uh, it could have ended very in a very ugly way and I'm glad it didn't. Um, I just do want to recap the Thor thing. So you were shoved into another elders meeting and interrogated about going to see Thor and one of the elders had been to see Thor himself. So basically what went down was, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you actually the, the whole story, the, the whole, the whole thing. So 
what happens is my parents and I are going to be moving from uh, an apartment to a smaller apartment. And we have a time that the movers will show up and we know that. Uh, on that day, I get invited to a advanced screening of Thor and it happens to be in the morning at 10 a.m., which sucks, but whatever. Um, it was free. Now I, I go to my dad and I say an early review of Thor will really help my channel. This would be really nice to have. Uh, I know we're moving on that day. I know the movers are coming at this time. If you can just give me an hour, I will be there and help move and I will be ready to go. And my dad's like, that's not a problem. Totally fine. Literally the morning of the screening, I am already going to the movie with my Jehovah's Witness friend. <laughs> I get a call from my dad and he says, the movers have changed their time. They're actually going to be here an hour earlier than before. It's okay though. It's not your fault. Enjoy the movie. So I go and I see Thor. So that means that suddenly it looks like I'm not helping my parents move. And I am watching Thor. <laughs> and so you already see where this is going. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, and this is completely out of our hands because the movers called us and said, hey, we have to change our time. Is that okay? My dad says, sure. Doesn't matter. I'm driving to Cleveland at this point to see Thor. So, Did they read the scripture, he who does not care for those who are his own <laughs> is worse than the person without faith? I imagine, I would imagine oh, so. Oh, grief, yeah. What happens is one of the elders had agreed to help us move as well. Uh, so he's there helping my parents move, and I'm not. I'm going to see Thor with my young Jehovah's Witness friend. And this makes me look really bad, even though my Especially parents Especially when I... they're moving the grand piano, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All we had was like little Jehovah's Witness stuff. <laughs> we had like little knickknacks and 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 clothing. Like that's <laughs> yeah. You know. Anyway, um, so this makes me look bad because I'm not there. I'm seeing this movie. I took a young Jehovah's Witness with me to see the movie. When the movie ends, I I pick up my phone. It was on silent. I got a, I have a voicemail from this elder and, um, a little background about him to make this clear. He's from Chicago. He was not raised a witness. He told many stories from the platform often about his knife fighting days in back alleys of Chicago. So he's a rather brutish individual. And I will admit that when he first was put to our hall, uh, transferred to our hall, he was a breath of fresh air because he, he was like a regular guy. So I have this message and he is irate. He is actually yelling. Why aren't you here? Your parents need your help. You went to see a movie and you took a young Jehovah's witness with you. He didn't say young Jehovah's witness. You know, he, he said the person's name, mm. he, you, know, you know, you took him with you. And, and you, I can't believe you did this. Get your butt here now. So I drive home and I help my parents with the rest of the move and everything goes smoothly. I later show that voicemail to my mother and I play it for my dad as well. And I will admit this is the first time that my dad has ever in his life said that shouldn't have been handled that way. Now, that's a lot for my dad to say. So, because of that event, I am called into the elders meeting, and it becomes about the fact that I wasn't there to help, even though my parents and I had an agreed upon schedule and we knew exactly what we were gonna be doing, and I was moving all of my belongings and helping them with their belongings, and it was all agreed upon early. It's just that the movers called and changed the time at the last second. That's the only thing that changed. So it was that combined with what I had seen and the fact that I had taken a friend to see it. 
And the brother who baptized me, who dunked me under the water, looks me in the eye and he says, what is Thor? And I, I know exactly where he's going with this. And so I play into his hand. I say, a pagan god. And he says, and do they praise Thor as a god in the film? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, man, I actually, I said what I wanted to say for the first time in this moment. I actually looked him in the eye and I said, the film is actually about someone who becomes so haughty that his father strips him of all of his abilities and banishes him to earth to learn humility. And the elder went, uh, I see. <laughs> so, because I, I just couldn't take it. I just, I couldn't mm. take that he was, he was, he just thought I went and saw a movie where a bunch of people bowed down to Thor for two hours. <laughs> that would not have been a very interesting movie, I've got to say. No, um, yeah. no, <laughs> it, no, it wasn't. But that was one of the last meetings I ever attended because I remember um, there were a, a few more meetings after that and a couple of memorials. Um, for those who aren't, don't know, aren't familiar, memorial is uh, they, the remembrance of uh, Jesus' sacrifice. They pass unleavened bread and wine and stuff. So there were a few more of those. But I remember sitting at the Kingdom Hall for, for one of those remaining meetings and thinking, um, wow, this sounds fake. This just doesn't sound right. I would read things. Certain points they made were very basic points that were, okay, yeah, sure, fine, respect your elders, respect your parents, respect your family, all that kind of, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Then they'd get to something more obscure, a very Jehovah's Witness thing. And I would just be like, this, this is crazy. I don't, why am I here? You know, but this was hard because I still lived at home. So I had to find a way to make enough money to move out, to have my own place while also remaining sane for those remaining months at my parents' house or apartment and and still not go to the meetings so it started with a lot of excuses i have a headache i have i'm sick i don't feel well eventually i think they got the point because i stopped making excuses and i stopped going and uh, the 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 well wishes started to pour in you know this person asks where you've been hopes you're okay this person it misses you this person wants to know if you're feeling better all that stuff and you know there were no phone calls though for many of these people it would just be my parents were just couriers for the information um pretty soon i was marked like i talked about in the video and they don't warn you when they do that they just do it my parents are sitting there suddenly feeling incredibly embarrassed that a, a talk is being given about their son and that was it. Um, like I said in the video, best friend my whole life leaves a voicemail on my phone, says, we can't get dinner. You've been marked. Sorry, my brother. Goodbye. And that's the way it goes. That's the, that's, that's the way it is, man. And I have an interesting story with that person. I can tell you, um, he, Please, yeah. yeah, he, um, a couple years later, I, was planning my wedding and I knew my parents would come. So we decided to go out of our way to make the wedding completely accepting to everyone. It was at a cafe. Uh, the, there was no priest or anything. It was an, a, an officiant, like a legal officiant. There was no religious ceremony of any kind. We did nothing inappropriate to any faith that I could find. Uh, even our music choices were all very innocent. So I decided I'll invite my old friend. So I go to his house, I knock on the door, and I hand him an invitation to my wedding. And he thanks me and I express to him, I, I express to him everything I just said to you, that this is not a church, not a priest, not a religious ceremony, just want to have you there because I've known you my whole life. It was my last attempt to sort of extend 
an olive branch to this individual. Of course, he didn't come, uh, which really didn't surprise me that much. He was one of like 40 people we invited. We had about 35 people at our wedding, very small wedding. And the fact that he didn't come, even though we invited him, meant that we paid for his meal. We paid for a yeah, seat he, for him. Yeah, he didn't have the courtesy to say that he wasn't coming so that you Correct. could make other arrangements. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. We, pay, we paid for his meal. We paid for his seat. We, we did all that. Um, of course, he didn't show up. A few years later, I get a text message from him with a picture of a little piece of paper that has his name on it that says public talk. So he is inviting me to come see his first public talk. <laughs> Yeah. He, and I realize, okay, he's on his way to being an elder. He is full on JW. He is going for it. So he invites me to the public talk. Later that year, my mom is kind of in a bad place. She's feeling a little more depressed. And I decide to go to the memorial for my mom. It's 45 minutes out of a year. I did it for my mom this one year. While I'm there, of course, everyone is so happy to see me, but here comes my friend. And he says, Chris, my brother, it is so nice to see you. I missed you at my public talk. And I looked him in the eye and I said, really, I missed you at my wedding. And you know, I just shook his hand and walked away because hmm. there's a complete disregard for a, a relative sense of normalcy. Hmm. I say that story to you and you think, you know, but to him, that was normal. That was normal conduct to just disregard your lifelong friend's wedding, even though, and my wife also, I must commend for going out of her way to make sure that the wedding went a certain way for some of these people because my people wife didn't attend yeah yeah my my wife was never a jehovah's witness and my my wife had dreamt about this wedding for for many years and how she wanted to look and how she wanted everything to be my wife is jewish and and she was like we won't do anything none of those things that could potentially offend and still some of these people didn't show up even though we invited them and i just felt that that was cruel it is cruel and unfortunately it's completely predictable uh behavior you know lots of people watching my channel who are themselves jehovah's witnesses perhaps pmo or who have been who have been jehovah's witnesses will totally relate to that story so yeah it, it's really sad um I, I hope you don't mind but we'll we'll begin navigating our way to the end i did have one or two final questions i wanted to ask um which was the bigger revelation in your video uh the, your apostasy or coming out as a pansexual <laughs> oh man well i mean i i think the pansexual uh because everyone that i know outside of youtube knows about my uh, religious upbringing. Um, anyone that I had ever worked with professionally, I had we had talked about it. All my friends, you know, they all knew. And and any time a friend of mine would get like a pamphlet or something in the mail, I'd be like, "Don't read it," you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> but only about five or six people knew um, how I felt uh, about being pansexual, and so. That was uh, something I decided to do because of how many ex Jehovah's Witness stories I had read from people who felt that the organization had psychologically damaged them and making them feel like they had to be one way and one way only and that there was no alternative and that was just, that was it. And I had seen a lot of pain that was caused from people who felt that they had to hide who they were and I just decided that if I was going to uh, talk about this, that I would do it in a, in a capacity that could potentially help people. Um, and I was, I was very relieved to see that there were plenty of folks 
uh, especially there's like a, there's a LGBT, uh, Jehovah's witness group on Facebook, uh, that I joined. And a lot of people were like, this is awesome. We need more of this. So I, I'm very relieved that that went, uh, that that helped. It will have helped because let's face it, the organization's really doubling down with its homophobic yeah. stance. It's been releasing yeah. some incredibly hateful material, not just talks, but also, you know, dramatizations. I don't know what you make of the way the organization's gone in that direction, because that's kind of happened presumably in the years since you've left or since you've yeah. faded the organizations yeah. almost trying to go full Hollywood <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of going in the direction that you were going in almost in a way. I know. I'm like, so... I could have directed those for you, man. <laughs> 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 no, like I, uh, I'm shocked actually by, by how much they've doubled down on it, on their homophobia, transphobia, everything. Like I said in my video, every, everything phobia It's everything that isn't this, mm. you know, specific way is, uh, is wrong. Um, I, you know, and like I said in my video, I didn't fully realize that about myself until after I left. And it was, it took looking back on certain things I would express or things that I was drawn to. And those things were quickly denounced in some way as wrong. And, and I would just, oh, it's wrong. Okay, whatever. It's wrong. And I would just move away from whatever that was. And it, it kind of helped me understand my life a lot once I came to terms with that and, and talk to my wife about it and talk to my friends about it. And, and, um, every single person that I have spoken to, except for surprise, one Jehovah's witness who's in my family has been very, very understanding and accepting. And, um, it's, it's been great. Have you ever been tempted to do reviews of Jehovah's witness propaganda movies? <laughs> so, no, but, uh, I have, I really wanted to review the film apostasy, right? um, because I thought it was excellent and, but I knew there was no way that I could review it without also talking about my, my past and I wasn't ready yet. So, um, I spoke briefly through, through messaging with that director actually today, which was really, Oh, cool. wow. Daniel. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was really nice. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was great to get that over with and just, Hey, all right, moving on. Cause to me, I've been out of this religion for, for 10 years, but I felt like there was still one tether that was keeping me. And it was just talking about it publicly and being honest about it and just reaching out to other people and, and seeing the stories that have been sent to me, uh, and, and the people who have expressed, things, uh, gratitude, uh, told, told me their, you know, their horror stories has been, uh, remarkable. And I'm just so grateful and to any of those folks who are watching. Thank you for doing that. Really. I tried to read as many as I could and like as many as I could respond to some. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. But come on, you've got to do a review of apostasy. <laughs> you just got to. It's, it's Spoiler filled review of apostasy. <laughs> apostasy in depth analyzed explained. <laughs> <laughs> Will you do it? Come on. Yeah. Your fans uh, eventually demand. eventually yeah. I'd like to, yeah. Eventually yeah. I'd like to. Um yeah. I have uh, like three reviews that are already done that I'm gonna be posting soon and then it's like some new release stuff that's coming out. Sure. But yeah, eventually I would like to. I really would. Mm -hmm. I would like to just Brilliant. maybe interview interview the filmmaker and just kind of talk about like you know just the basics of how he got that film made. You know, who did he have to talk to for financing and how did he go through that process? I would really like to to interview him at some point. He's a wonderful guy, Daniel. Um, another question: It's common knowledge that beards and apostasy go together, so. Have you felt your beard grow more as the apostasy has been <laughs> welling up inside of you? <laughs> oh man! See, I forgot to mention that in my video that beards are are bad. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's I forgot to mention that. I I completely forgot. No beards. Beards are bad. I remember even when I was still pretty strong in the faith, asking my dad why I couldn't have a beard because I started shaving pretty early. And he would be like, well, son, it's just, uh, it's a sign of rebellion. 
And I was like, but Jesus has a beard in the greatest man book. Look, beard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he went, well, Jesus is the exception. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, when I first left, the honest truth is I hate shaving. I hate it. Yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I had to try like eight different shaving creams because they all made me either break out, get hives, or uh, just affect my skin in a bad way. And, and I hated doing it. I eventually switched to an electric razor. That helped a little bit. But I had to do it every day, like twice a day because my hair grows really fast. So when I left, I remember I was getting stubble. And I do remember some of the last few meetings, elders would come up to me and be like, so you got some stubble going on there. What's up with that? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just it's, it's just hair, you know. I've so, had that exact thing where I've been to the meeting and I was waking up in the process of waking up and, oh, it's a bit of stubble there, Lloyd. <laughs> um, two you, more questions. You're looking like a rebellious one. <laughs> two more questions. On a scale of 9 to 10... Nine being excellent, ten being perfect. How good is the new Star Wars trilogy? <laughs> <laughs> I like the Mandalorian quite a bit. Um, I love the I love the Mandalorian. Yeah. I liked Force Awakens. Thought it was a great setup. I just thought that the the progression was a bit uh, messy. Okay, no, I, I agree. That's with my you. that's my honest example. Yeah. <laughs> also, Brilliant. the last four episodes of the of the Clone Wars uh, animation, the last four episodes, amazing, amazing. I like that they've brought Dave Filoni in to do the Mandalorian because he clearly gets Star Wars and he clearly understands yep. that universe. So that's brilliant. Yep. Um, I wore, I wore finally, this shirt because I know you're a fan. I, this is why I wore oh, the shirt. I'm, I know you're. <laughs> I'm all over the Mandalorian. And final question: um, words of inspiration and motivation to people watching who perhaps are themselves having their dreams crushed or who are perhaps themselves torn over whether it's worthwhile escaping. I think that when I was at that point, my biggest fear was just losing my associates and my family. And there was also a part of me that was still very conditioned to believe the things that I had heard and that I had been taught. And I was very scared of God killing me as well. So what I can say is that it is absolutely better. The air is fresher, cleaner on the other side. You will make friends. You will meet people who actually like you. They don't just like you because you're part of the club. They will like you because you are a person and because they like you as a person. And that for me has been absolutely eye-opening. Um, I started going to movie screenings and that's kind of how I met a lot of people that I'm now friends with, just other people who like movies and who understood and, and kind of understood the passion and wanted to talk about that kind of stuff. I remember some of the first earlier conversations, like where I actually got to talk to people about movies for a long time. And I thought that was just magical. So yes, please. I know it's hard. I know that it's difficult. Uh, but you, there is a path out. There is a path out of that place and it will be hard. There will be very tough days and you could potentially lose people that are close to you, but it is better and it is worth making that effort because living a lie is just, it's damaging to you and, and you need to, you need to find a path out and, and it's hard, but it can be done. Perfectly put. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you for your bravery and courage in sharing your story. I've done it myself, so I know how difficult it is. Yeah. Um, on paper, it's the obvious thing to do, but there are real world consequences. And um, I think that you've done the right thing. And I'm sure many will be drawing inspiration from your story. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been watching your channel for a long time, way before I ever decided to, to uh, talk about it. So it was really nice. Thank you, man. My absolute pleasure. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I certainly have. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, 
Thank you for watching. Oh,